Hi, my name is Bob Scandura, and I'm a product manager at Mercury Systems. This presentation isn't about one particular technology or protocol. It's really about the entire signal chain and how high bandwidth data flow can be achieved in a typical data acquisition system. From the data converters through the processing and out to data storage, which is a typical signal path for many of our customers. And why do we need to be able to capture and play back higher and higher bandwidths? Let me show you one requirement that we see in many different application spaces. As data converters continue to evolve and sample rates continue to rise, more and more of the RF spectrum is being sampled in a single stage. Direct RF sampling is desirable in more and more applications. So what does direct RF sampling look like? In a traditional heterodyne architecture or a superhet radio, a signal is received at the antenna and it's filtered through a bandpass filter. It then passes through a low noise amplifier and then filtered again through a tighter bandpass filter and then it's sent to the mixer. And what frequency signals are we talking about receiving? It could be a wide range depending on the components we're using, but in this example, I'm going from 1 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. But again, it could easily go to 200 or 300 gigahertz. The RF signal is being fed into the mixer, and at the same time, a local oscillator feeds a sine wave into the mixer, and the two signals are combined, and the resulting different signal is the intermediate frequency, or the IF. What the mixer is doing is translating the RF signal down to a lower intermediate frequency that can be digitized. The IF then goes through an IF amplifier and a narrow bandpass filter that matches the sample range of the A to D where it's actually digitized. So what are typical IFs? 70 to 500 megahertz is a pretty common range. So now let's take a look at how we would accomplish this with direct RF sampling. First, we need an A to D converter that can sample more of the RF spectrum, so we use an RF A to D. Because the A to D can sample the RF directly, we don't need to translate it down to the IF, so we can remove the mixer and move the converter to the RF source. So can we sample from 1 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz? Well, technology hasn't gotten us there yet, but let's take a look at how much of the spectrum we can sample. If I map what is referred to as the satellite frequency bands, we go from L band up to KU band at 18 gigahertz, and there's actually a K band and a KA band above that, which brings us to 40, but for now I'm going to leave those off. If we look at the RF A to Ds available over the past 10 years, we went from 1.8 gigasamples per second to 3.6 to 6.4, and now we're at 10 gigasamples per second, or a little bit higher. And there are actually A to Ds that go higher than that, but I'm limiting the A to Ds to a resolution of 12 bits or greater, because this is a pretty common requirement for radar and communications applications. So now we have an application that requires a high bandwidth converter. Let's see what the system block diagram looks like. The core of the system are the data converters and the FPGA to process the data. To keep things simple, I'm really going to focus on the A to D converters, but, but every part of the technology we look at today is applicable to the D to A converters also. There is likely some memory in the system for data buffering or as a resource for processing. And while the entire application might live on the FPGA, some applications require storing the data once it's acquired, or in the other direction, data storage might be used to stream data to the FPGA where it gets played out of the D to A converter. The converters in FPGA are typically combined on the same PCB. In this case, I'm depicting a 3 UVPX board, which is a pretty common form factor for these applications. And because we want to stream at high data rates to a storage component, I'm going to show an optical interface which will give us the high-speed pipe coming out of the board. Since I showed this as a VPX board, let's put this in a VPX chassis and add a single board computer that will act as a system controller or could even be another processing resource. On the storage side, a popular way to implement a storage system is in a rack mount PC chassis, or sometimes you see PCs in rugged enclosures. Here I'll show a typical PC motherboard with PCIe slots. In one slot we'll put a NIC or a network interface card with an optical interface, and that'll match the optical interface in the VPX card, and then a RAID card with NVMe solid state drives. So in this diagram, every arrow or backplane where data passes through is a potential bottleneck, or if you want to look at it in a more positive way, it's an opportunity to use the latest technology to get the best possible performance. So starting with the data converters, we'll look at JESD204 as an interface to the FPGA. Then we'll look at the gigabit serial interfaces on the FPGA that are used to support JESD204. Then we'll look at memory resources, and particularly high bandwidth memory or HBM. Then we'll look at moving data on and off the board with gigabit Ethernet interfaces and optical interfaces, and how these can all be used within a SOSA-aligned system. And then we'll move out of the chassis to the storage side and look at PCIe and solid-state storage and RAIDs. So let's start with JESD204. 
Here I'm showing an A to D in FPGA, but it would be the same drawing if it was a D to A converter. So to look at the serial interfaces like JESD204, I think it's a good idea to first look at parallel interfaces that have been used for many years. So with a 12-bit A to D, we would have 12 pairs of wires, each carrying one of the bits of data that make up the 12-bit sample, and an additional pair to carry a clock. This is a simple and effective solution, but I showed an A to D with a sample rate of 1.6 gigahertz, or 1.6 gigasamples per second, because that's about the highest sample rate you can support with this model. The limit is the speed of the parallel interfaces on the FPGA. They can run at about 800 megahertz or a little bit higher, and if you use double data rate clocking, you can achieve um, a clock rate of 1.6 gigahertz, and that's why I showed a 1.6 gigahertz A to D. So what if you want to go faster to support a faster A to D to direct sample a wider range of the spectrum? Let's say we want to quadruple the sample rate to 6.4 gigahertz. Well, we can't make the interface go faster, but we can make it go wider. So we need to draw a larger A to D to make it fit, um, and we'll quadruple the amount of connections between the A to D and FPGA. And the solution works, but it adds complexity to the PCB design to handle what are now 104 wires, and FPGAs do have a finite amount of parallel interfaces, so you won't be able to support more than about two channels of data converters on most FPGAs. The other solution is to use gigabit serial interfaces, where each signal pair is transferring data at much higher rates, and the same 6.4 GHz A to D can be connected to the FPGA with eight JESD204 gigabit serial pairs. So let's take a look at currently available A to Ds from two of the major manufacturers. I'm going to plot sample rate versus resolution. So first, for Texas Instruments. And what you see is what you'd expect, that the lower sample rates, uh, higher resolution up to 16 bits. And as we move out and we go to higher uh, sample rates, we see the resolution go down to 12 bits. There are actually faster converters available, but I didn't want to drop again below that 12-bit resolution. If we look at analog devices, we see a similar picture. And when I overlay the two manufacturers, you really can see it's the same curve across both. So now what I'd like to do is sort these converters. First show the converters that use parallel LVDS interfaces, and then converters that use JESD serial interfaces. What you can see pretty clearly, as we get to higher sample rates, the JESD204 interface is favored. And once we get above 6.4 and moving towards the 10 gigasamples per second and above, it must be serial. So let's take a look at JESD204. As we said, JESD204 runs on gigabit serial interfaces. So on the converter side, it's hardwired into the A to D converter chip with a D to A. On the FPGA side, it's implemented using an IP core. JESD204 isn't new. It was first released in 2006, but with each new update, uh, new features have been added, and the speed of the serial interfaces has gotten faster to where now we support 32.5 gigabits per second, which in turn allows us faster sample rates on the converters. And again, the JESD204 interface on the converters need to connect to the gigabit serial interfaces on the FPGA. Like the JESD204 interfaces, the FPGA gigabit serial interfaces have gotten faster over time. So if we look at the families from Xilinx over the past 10 years, or I guess a little more than 10 years, um, we start with Vertex 6, where the interface speed was 6.6 .6 gigabits per second. And with each subsequent family, the interfaces have become faster to 58 gigabits per second on UltraScale Plus, and now 112 gigabits per second on Versal. If we look at Intel, formerly Altera, they have a similar history. Starting with Stratix 3, which didn't actually have gigabit serial interfaces, they were first introduced in Stratix 4 um, at 11 gigabits per second, all the way through Agile X today, where they're running at 116 gigabits per second. And just to show the comparison, the parallel LVDS interfaces on these FPGAs haven't gotten much faster. Across both Xilinx and Intel, we went from 1.25 gigabits per second to about 1.6 gigabits per second during that same period. And that doesn't mean that the parallel interfaces are necessarily inferior to gigabit serial interfaces. It's just that they serve different requirements, and high bandwidth transfers isn't one of them. So from the previous slide, the latest version of JESD204 is JESD204C, which is capable of running the serial lanes at 32.5 gigabits per second. So if we want to support these higher speed, faster rated Ds for direct RF sampling, we want to make sure we're supporting JESD204C in our system. So we need UltraScale Plus or Versal from Xilinx or Stratix 10 or Agile X from Intel to hit those gigabit serial speeds. Going back to our block diagram, we now have data streaming into the FPGA, so let's look at the options for memory. A good place to start is to look at some of the technologies that require memory. So I'll plot these over a 10-year period again, 
and plot them against the increased bandwidth requirements. Starting with Ethernet, we were at 10 gigasamples per second 10 years ago, then we moved to 40, and now we're at 100 and we're moving towards 400 gigabits per second. If we look at video, 10 years ago we were at 1K for high def, and now we've moved on to 2K and 4K, and now we're seeing 8K video resolution. For DSP processors, specifically on FPGAs, we were thrilled um, with Vertex 6 to get 2,000 DSP slices back in 2010, but now we moved on to 12,000 in UltraScale Plus and 14,000 on Versal. And relevant, relevant to what we've been looking at now, A to D converters have gone from 1 gigasample per second uh, faster and faster up to 10 gigasamples per second today. All of these technologies require memory, either for buffering or for storage or as a resource when processing. So if we look at DDR DRAM, we've gone from DDR3 to DDR4 with a few variations, but we've really only seen about a doubling of bandwidth. And DDR5 is just starting to make an appearance, but from side-by-side -side tests I've seen so far, DDR5 is only about 5 or maybe 10% faster than DDR4, depending on which, which benchmarks you look at. I mean, the next few years, DDR5 will start getting clocked faster, and I'm sure that'll change. But for now, traditional parallel interface DDR memories are just not keeping up with the bandwidth requirements of many popular technologies. A possible solution is high bandwidth memory, or HBM. And this technology is starting to be used with different types of processors, but I'll focus on FPGAs. HBM stacks multiple memory dies on top of each other and puts that stack in the same IC package as the FPGA. The two smaller rectangles here in the photo below the main vertex die are the HBMs. This removes the PCB material, the routing complexity, and the speed bottlenecks of having external memory. It, it enables what, what is an amazing transfer bandwidth of up to 460 gigabytes per second. So to put that in some perspective, that's about a 20 times increase over traditional DRAM. External memory interfaces are eliminated and they're replaced with on-chip routing, realizing a power savings of about four times less power per bit. And the discrete DRAM IC footprints are removed from the board, enabling a more compact circuit design and reducing board layer count to connect those external memories to the FPGA. And while the FPGA package does grow a little bit because you're adding those HBM dies, it's really far less than the amount of real estate that, let's say, eight external DRAM chips um, would be that it replaces. So HBM provides unique high data throughput while addressing size, weight, and power requirements, well, at least size and power requirements, um, in, a, in this technology. And for our data converter example, it's needed for buffering high bandwidth converter data when streaming or for snapshot storage where a time slice of data gets stored at full sample rate and then it either gets processed or maybe offloaded at a slower rate. Now let's take a look at the interfaces to get data on and off the board and how they work within a SOSA aligned system. What is the mission of SOSA? In January of 2019, the U.S. Army, Air Force, and Navy released a joint memo, sometimes called the Tri-Services Memo, calling for a move by manufacturers and integrators to define an open and common standard that can be used across all three services. And some of the goals of this initiative are listed here. So Mercury is part of the working group defining the hardware standard, and the definition continues to move forward. The first official release, 1.0, was released in the fall of 2021. And Mercury, as well as other vendors, are moving towards producing more and more products that are SOSA aligned. So what is SOSA? It's a technical standard that leverages a number of existing standards, including 3U and 6U OpenVPX, which is what I'd like to focus on. OpenVPX defines how the boards in a system interact with the backplane and how they communicate with each other. So this is a typical 3U VPX board. OpenVPX defines what signals are on these connectors, or viewed from the other side, you can see the connectors. And as part of the standard, OpenVPX describes the signals on these connectors with a profile. So over time, many OpenVPX profiles have been created and added to the specification. SOSA defines a much smaller set of all possible OpenVPX profiles to enable compatibility and interoperability between different vendors' boards. And the SOSA standard addresses a range of, of technical details, including software and hardware maintenance. But for now, let's just look at the VPX interface within SOSA. Going back to our system drawing, I'll remove the storage portion to make room for the SOSA Align board. SOSA specifies 10 and 40 gigabit Ethernet on the OpenVPX data plane. So here in the block diagram and here physically on the VPX connector on the board. If the SBC is also SOSA aligned, it will have a 10 or a 40 gig E on the correct pins on the connector as per the OpenVPX profile for an SBC within SOSA. I mentioned the data plane a moment ago. 
If you're not familiar with OpenVPX, the data plane are dedicated signals routed through the backplane to carry, well, data. So we're talking about a path between the FPGA board through the backplane to the SBC. And it's very possible, even likely, that the data from the A to D is being processed in the FPGA before it's sent to the SBC and getting data reduced. But to show the maximum bandwidth, I'm going to assume the raw A to D data in this case is being passed through the FPGA at the full sample rate of the converter. So let's look at how much bandwidth um, each interface can support. The 10 gig E interface supports a maximum data transfer rate of 1.25 gigabytes per second. So we could sustain the full data rate from a converter sampling at 1.25 gigahertz, or another way is to say it's a 1.25 giga sample per second converter if the samples are 8 bits or byte wide. If we wanted 16 bit resolution, we'd be moving twice as much data for each sample. So we have to half the sample rate to 0.625 gigahertz, or you could say 650 mega samples per second. If we move up to the 40 gig E interface, we have a maximum data transfer rate of 5 gigabytes per second. And we can now stream from a 5 giga sample per second converter at 8 bits. If we want more resolution, again, we can have the sample rate and increase the sample width. I listed 2.5 giga sample per second converters at 16 bits to show the calculation, but the best resolution you'll get from a 2.5 gigahertz converter right now is about 14 bits. Fortunately, SOSA defines optional optical interfaces as part of the spec, which is ideal for moving data out of the chassis. So in the block diagram, it's right here, and on the board connector, the optical interface is right here. SOSA doesn't define a specific protocol in these interfaces, but if I run 100 gigabit ethernet, then I have an additional path to stream my data with a max transfer rate of 12.5 gigabytes per second. So that could theoretically support a 12.5 giga sample per second converter well, with 8-bit resolution or a 6.25 giga sample per second converter with double the resolution. And here again, I've listed 16 bits, but 12 bits is more like what you'll get it's currently with a 6.25 giga sample per second A to D. Also, 400 gig E is just starting to make an appearance, which quadruples the 12.5 gigabyte per second rate, but we're still a little away from seeing it being mainstream. Going back to our block diagram, the last stage of our system is data storage. We can stream out of our VPX chassis using 100 gig E optical, giving us a transfer rate of 12.5 gigabytes per second. And if we're direct sampling RF, we probably want to record as much of that data at the highest rate possible. So we need to support that 100 gig E rate with the storage that can keep up. I'm showing a server PC, but this could easily be a PC in a rugged enclosure. What we need to do is stream the data from the network interface card receiving the 100 gig E to the RAID card where it's stored on solid state drives. And I'm showing a motherboard with Gen 4 PCIe slots because that's pretty much as fast as we're going today. Gen 5 is just starting to ship, but, but full support of Gen 5 will really be towards the middle or the end of 2022. First, let's take a look at the evolution of data storage drives. Here I'm plotting about the last 10 years versus data transfer rates in megabytes per second. I started with SATA interfaced hard disk drives. And for any storage device, two things really determine the overall transfer speed, the interface and the storage medium. So in 2003, SATA was released as an interface protocol. And at the time, the hard drive medium was actually a little bit faster than the interface. So the transfer rate was limited to SATA at 150 megabytes per second. In 2004, SATA 2 was released, which was capable of 300 megabytes per second, but the drives were the limiting factor, and the media ran at about 190 megabytes per second. In 2007, solid-state drives became available and replaced hard disk drives, and they could transfer data at the full SATA 2 rate of 300 megabytes per second. Then in 2008, SATA 3 was released and achieved 600 megabytes per second. Then in 2013, NVMe became available, and that replaced SATA as an interface. So NVMe is based on PCIe, and in this case, four lanes of PCIe Gen 3. So we saw a big jump in performance to peak read rates of about 3,000 megabytes per second and peak write rates of about 1,440 megabytes per second. Then in 2020, NVMe adopted PCIe Gen 4, and the peak rates rose to 7,000 megabytes per second for reads and 5,300 megabytes per second for writes. And in the past two months, some prototype drives using NVMe PCIe Gen 5 have been announced. So that'll be the next increment in performance, doubling the speed of Gen 4, probably towards the end of this year. Going back to our block diagram, we said the 100 gig interface is streaming data at 12.5 gigabytes per second. And we said the motherboard is built on PCIe Gen 4. So let's look at the PCIe speed. PCIe Gen 1 gave us throughput of 250 megabytes per second. 
And because PCIe allows us to bond lanes, four lanes will give us four times that throughput, eight lanes doubles that, and then 16 lanes doubles that again. Gen 2 doubled the single lane rate, which then doubled all the multiple lane rates, and we saw a doubling again with Gen 3 and Gen 4, with a maximum rate at Gen 4 by 16 at 32 gigabytes per second. And again, these are peak rates. Sustained rates are actually a little bit lower. I listed Gen 5 for reference, but for today, Gen 4 is really the standard, giving us uh, a peak of 32 gigabytes per second. For my previous slide, we said NVMe SSDs running PCIe Gen 4 have a maximum write speed of 5,300 megabytes per second. And that's really at the very top edge of the performance. So across different drives and different benchmarks, it might be a little bit less. But let's just say it's 5.3 gigabytes per second for this chart. The RAID supports four NVMe drives, increasing the aggregate rate to 21.2 gigabytes per second. And again, even if there's some overhead or we're using slower drives, there's still plenty of headroom to handle the 12.5 gigabytes per second, uh, which is the rate coming from the 100 gig E that we want to record onto the drives. So going back to our original block diagram, we looked at sampling RF signals using JSD204. We looked at gigabit serial interfaces, HBM, 10, 40, and 100 gig E. Uh, and on the storage side, we looked at PCIe and NVMe SSDs. Now let's take a look at two systems using some of the protocols and the technology. This is a multi-band receiver with processing and a data recorder backend. Starting on the left side, the model RFM3202 is an RF tuner and down converter that has an RF input range of 0.3 gigahertz to 18 gigahertz. Now the RFM3202 has two output modes. The first is the tuner output with a down converted signal with an IF of 3.4 gigahertz to 5.4 gigahertz, which lines up with the 6.4 gigasample per second A to D on the model 54141. And the 54141 uses JSD204 to interface the data converters to a Xilinx UltraScale FPGA. The second output of the RFM3202 passes signals between 0.3 gigahertz and 2 gigahertz directly. So the RF is sampled by the 5953 and processed, and the raw data is also streamed over the 100 gigi optical interface to the model 2757 100 gigi recorder. And this recorder looks a lot like what we just showed uh, in the previous block diagram. It's using NVMe RAIDs to store the data. The second system is using a model 5553. This is a board based on Xilinx's RFSOC system on chip, or RFSOC. The RFSOC has 8 A to D channels at 5 gigasamples per second and 8 D to A channels at 9.8 gigasamples per second, along with almost a million logic cells in the FPGA fabric and over 4,000 DSP slices. While the FPGA resources on the RFSOC are, are substantial, the amount of data that can be generated by the A to Ds or required to feed the D to As can require even more FPGA processing. So the model 5586 is a coprocessor that complements the RFSOC board by more than doubling the processing resources. And here we're using two 100 gigi interfaces, optical interfaces, to move data between the boards. And the 5586 uses a Vertex UltraScale Plus FPGA with eight gigabytes of high bandwidth memory, or HBM, on chip. Also, the boards are SOSA aligned so all the interfaces are consistent with the SOSA specification. So that was my last slide. I hope this gave you a view of some of the technologies and protocols that we use to build these data acquisition and processing and storage systems. If you'd like more information, please visit us at www.mrcy.com. Thank you.